what's really interesting is that I've only been here for three of the talks, but you know, I heard some fantastic stuff about innovation. I'm not going to talk to you about innovation, <coughs> technical no. innovation, because I know nothing about technical stuff. Not really particularly interested, to be honest. I'm sorry. I hope I haven't offended any of you. I'm really interested in business processes. I'm actually interested in the bottom line of money, and that's what I do in my business. What I'm going to talk to you about, though, is think about how do we create innovation within our business. We've heard of loads of opportunities to innovate. We're going to think about how do we make that happen in our business. Sadly, I've only got 20 minutes to do that, but maybe I'm a typical consultant, and I don't give you too much information because, you know, clearly I can charge for some of it. So let's think about this. Innovation, the key to success. We live in a VUCA world. Has anyone heard that expression before? Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Those are the times that we are living in. But here's the thing. Get over it. We've always lived in those times. Who's this, John? Do you know? Anyone know? One of the Greek philosophers. Uh, 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 Herodotus oh, okay. said, change is the only constant. And if I look back on my 58 years of, on this planet, 41 years in the horticultural industry, these guys' words are so wise. Change is the only constant. Let's just think back for just a moment. Here we go, 1963, Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't remember it, I was three. You can bet your bottom dollar that your parents, if they were my age, were petrified. We were on the brink of a world war. That is a VUCA time. That's more petrifying than Brexit, believe me. Remember this, 1973, winter of discontent. Interesting times. Fantastic ideological debate between the left and the right. Ted Heath, we've got, we got rubbish piling up on the streets. Really interesting times. Three-day working week, 50-mile-an-hour speed limits. You know, the Saudis didn't let us have any oil. Me and my dad playing cards, you know, round by candlelight. Sounds all a bit romantic now, doesn't it? But they were difficult times. They were VUCA times, 1973. <coughs> Well, we've had a couple of wars in my lifetime as well. This is the Falklands War, didn't impact me too much. But linking around the war is terrorism, creating VUCA times for us. Uh, I've also experienced, sorry, I've lived through four recessions. They haven't really impacted me at all, um, but they have other people. We had four recessions, 2008, you know, the worst one for many many years just when we thought boom and bust was going to end along comes the worst recession in our lifetime that is a VUCA time we've had terrorism we've got global warming and what's really interesting is that we're going to get bogged down in this Brexit debate but this is a far bigger issue than Brexit believe me there's also been disappointments in those last, um, uh, those last 58 years. I don't really remember 1966, but I do remember 1986, you know, Gaza crying. And I do remember, of course, this year uh, being in a pub in Woking when it was kicked off after we uh, lost. So there's been disappointments in those uh, 58 years as well. There's been disruption. Got an example here, picture of the uh, European <laughs> Union. Um, or, you know, the European continent. I've put this up there because what I've experienced in those last 58 years and what you've experienced is the growth of free trade. Absolutely fantastic, but it's made life more competitive for you and more challenging. But I've got to say to you again, get over that, because if you want a free market economy, you're going to get competition. You know, the uh, opposite to a free, economy, free market economy doesn't even bear thinking about so let's get over this, but you know that's what we've experienced in my lifetime. We've let's bring it back to a bit more horticultural things. You know we've experienced a bit of disruption in our sector as well by some diseases. Um, this is um, ash dieback, just to prove to you that I do know a little bit about uh, horticulture. And we're going to have more. You know we've got the threat of xylella for ornamental growers. That's quite a uh, a serious threat and it's quite a disruption to the business if it happens. 
And then, of course, we've got Amazon. We heard a little bit about Alibaba this morning and Jack Ma. These people are disrupting the way that we do business and the way our lives operate. Okay? Some of you might think it's for the good. Some of you might think it's for the bad. But these are disruptors and are really challenging what we're doing as an organisation. Um, because I largely work in the ornamental sector, I can tell you that the UK's largest garden centre of 33 million turnover is online. Second largest is a bricks and mortar one, that's Long Acres. The third largest garden centre in the UK is an online garden centre, 18 million with Crocus. So these people are disrupting what we're doing, and we've had disruption in our lifetime. We've got more coming. Some of you might suggest that um, that disruption has gone on a different scale. Okay? I actually think that this is a distraction in our business, to be honest. Now, with a uh, German surname and descendant, descended from a German economic migrant, you can guess which way I voted. I voted to remain. But it looks like we're going to exit the European Union. We don't know what that looks like. But let me tell you that times of disruption like this are fantastic for business. So when we get challenge, what really happens is that we have to innovate. And there's no way around it, but we will have to innovate. And those challenges breed innovation. I'm a big fan of um, watching space films on the TV. And one of my favourite ones is, um, you know, Tom Hanks in Apollo 13, where he's playing Jim Lovell. You know, they don't make it to the moon and they have to climb back into the command module and there's a sort of a build-up of CO2. Are you picturing this? And they have to innovate very quickly and create a CO2 filter out of some of these plastic folders or something. You might remember that. If you haven't seen it, it's a brilliant film. Go and see it. It's fantastic. Um, go and see it. What do I mean, go and see it? You don't need to do that. Just download on Netflix. <laughs> okay. But those challenges breed innovation. And from that space program, we've had a huge amount of innovation. These are scratch-resistant lenses. You're probably wearing scratch-resistant lenses today. That came from the space program. Hopefully you're not eating any of this this weekend, but this is freeze-dried food. That came from the space program. So here we've got an opportunity to land people on the moon. To do that, you have to innovate. Okay? We have an opportunity to really embrace this new culture that we're in, or that it's going to happen, and we're going to have to innovate. So I'd like to look at some techniques, and some tips on how you can bring about innovation within your organisation, because hopefully, I guess, you've all got the idea that you need to innovate. Is that right? Okay, phew. Because otherwise you probably wouldn't be here. Okay. First of all, it's good, though, these times of disruption, because for those of you that do innovate, you've got a tremendous opportunity to gain market share. Okay? And that's absolutely fantastic. Now, unfortunately, there's going to be winners and losers. And if you don't innovate, the chances are you might lose. But then, you know, that's all part of being in a free market economy. Get over it. There are going to be losers. But there's going to be winners. Make sure you're in one of those winners that is gaining market <coughs> share. Your factors of production in these times of disruption can often be cheaper, which is great news for you. Often we find that in times of disruption, your return on investment can be higher. But what I would say is that I think to capitalise on these times coming up, you need to be agile and quick. The good news about it is that most of the organisations in horticulture are small and medium-sized enterprises. That is under 250 employees and with a turnover of less than 50 million uh, euros. That's a criteria for SME. SMEs can be typified by being agile and quick. You can make decisions quickly. Okay, you haven't got big boards to go and answer to sometimes. You know, you're not bogged down into a lot of bureaucracy. So I think if we're going to capitalise on these times coming up, I think we've got to really be agile and quick. So one of my messages to you, before I get into the key message, is to go back and try and get more agility into your business. So, there's my argument. I think you're in a great position to innovate. I think these are fantastic times for us. Um, how are we going to do it? First of all, Let's explore innovation in non-obvious areas. Today's been great, and we've been thinking about innovation in obvious areas. But there are ways to innovate in non-obvious areas. 
you know, don't limit it just to market-facing opportunities. Here's a great innovation. I'm not sure whether it's working, but this is that thing, um, you know, the aubergine and the uh, potato from Thompson & Morgan called Tom Tato. No, that's the tomato one. Egg and chips is cool. Thank you. Right. Now, typically we innovate with our products, but don't just limit your innovation to market-facing. <laughs> Look at the way you produce the product. We've been thinking about that today. But also look at your processes. Are there ways that you can innovate in your processes? But actually, perhaps look at your strategy. You know, are there things you might need to do about your strategy? I don't know if did anyone listen to the uh, Philip Morris interview. You know, Philip Morris, Morris the tobacco people uh, from um, Winston Salem, North Carolina. Uh, they're having an innovative uh, strategy at the moment to encourage people to stop smoking. Interesting. Um, and we'll be moving into perhaps vaping and other products. Innovation in their strategy. So don't just limit innovation to product. Don't just limit to processes, but think about your strategy as well. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, let's explore accidental mistakes. Because often, when we make a mistake, it can lead to innovation. Not everything we do is intentional. So look for those things that are unintentional. And look, if we make a mistake, what is the learning <coughs> from that? And can we innovate from that mistake? If you forget everything else I say, please don't forget this guy's name, Matthew Said. Anyone read this book, Black Box Thinking? Excellent, we've got two or three. Superb book where he's blowing the lid on our approach to failure in the UK and is arguing that we need to embrace failure because mistakes are fantastic because they will lead us to innovate. Read this book. If you do nothing else from this conference, please read this book because it's superb, very well written. So look for innovation in accidental mistakes. Third thing is be, be dissatisfied. If we look at those businesses that are going to succeed over the next couple of years, it's going to be those people that are dissatisfied with how they're doing things. So challenge how you are doing things. Okay? Look for what's missing in your company. How are you going to do that? Well, do it by networking with colleagues. Do it by going to uh, other enterprises outside of the UK. You know, have the sense to think that actually someone might be doing it better than you, and I'd better go and find out what they're doing. Okay? Because there will be someone out there, I'm not trying to be disparaging it to you, but there'll be someone out there that's doing it better than you are. Okay? So go and find them, seek them out, and find out what's missing in your organisation. You know, just you know, get out there and go to America or Australia and find out what's happening. And um, of course the other advantage is that's a tax-free holiday. But you didn't hear that from me. Um, so question things, and I think within your organisation, nothing should be off limits, even those sacred cows, those things that we hold so dear. We've always done it that way. You know, that's what we're about. We can't do that. We've been doing that for 50 years. Get over that. Challenge those sacred cows. That's the third point. Fourth point is, oh, here we go. Let's develop a blame-free culture, shall we? Read Matthew Said, he'll talk to you about developing a blame-free culture. The challenge here is that some of your staff aren't innovating because they're afraid of making a mistake. And they're afraid about what you're going to say to them. Believe me. Okay? Because actually, you know what, the quality of British management is quite poor. We've been talking about productivity earlier. Here we go, I'm going off on one now. One of the reasons why productivity is pretty poor is because you know, the quality of our British management can be quite poor. So we've got a long way to go there. And the one thing we can really start to do if we want to be better managers is to allow our people to innovate and to allow them to make mistakes because when we make mistakes, we learn. And when we're making mistakes, innovation will come out of it. So go back and develop that blame-free culture, which means that we need to encourage our employees to be imaginative, creative, and to experiment. You might want to use some tools to create some innovation. Well, you've been hearing perhaps about Lean this morning or and Kaizen of, of continuous improvement. Those are great tools to start using in your business that will aid the process of innovation. Um, second point, uh, sixth point, sorry, is if your staff do, reward, um, do innovate, make sure you reward them. Okay? That doesn't have to be with big bucks. It can be you know, that praise or recognition. It could be 
I don't know, it could be an extra day off. You know, it doesn't have to be a lot of money. We make the mistake in thinking it's a whole lot of money. But make sure that if our staff innovate, that re we reward them well. Okay, the other thing we need to do is to make it a continuous loop. Innovation isn't a one-off, it is a continual process in our organisation, actually where it becomes part of the culture of our organisation. It should involve everyone. Absolutely. I believe that everyone in your organisation is capable of innovating at some level. The person that's doing a tedious, boring, routine job and is making the same movement perhaps four or five hundred times a day, the chances are if you created the environment for them, they would be able to come up with a better way of doing that job. Okay? We just haven't created those environments. So I think we need to challenge all that and involve everyone, but also select champions. Select those people that are perhaps uh, drawn to those qualities required to be an innovator. Those people that challenge, those people that have an inquiring mind, those people that uh, like to disrupt how things are doing. They're great to have in an organization. You don't want too many of them though, because you're gonna get into a lot of trouble. But you need a few of them. So look them out and uh, nurture them. So. That's it. That's seven ways that we're going to create innovation, uh, an innovation culture in, all, in our organisation. What I'd like to finish off is don't stagnate. If you want to stagnate, here's how to do it. I love this slide. It's fantastic. And I'm going to end with this. Okay. If you want to stagnate in your organisation, I don't believe that you want to. This is how you do it. We've never done it that way before. How interesting. Okay. Don't want to hear any of that in your organisation. We're not ready for that. Okay? Well, you might have to be ready for it. We're doing okay without it. Are you? Look at the bottom line. Is that saying you're doing okay without it? Maybe you are. We've tried that once. Oh, and it hasn't worked. Well, okay, maybe you didn't implement it correctly. Maybe there's a different way of doing it. It costs too much. Look at the cost of not doing it. Real challenge there. That's not our responsibility. Okay, it's everyone's responsibility. And finally, it will just not work. There we go. If you want to stagnate, promote that culture in your organization. I don't think you want to stagnate, uh, so let's make sure we do the opposite to that. So can I encourage you please to uh, go and innovate? All I've tried to do is just to give you some tips and techniques for developing innovation culture within your organisation. Uh, thanks for listening. Sorry about the waffle at the start, but I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Thanks.